At the end of Halloween 4, Michael Myers is shot by a lynch mob and police officers until he falls backward in a gaping hole in the ground. The ground starts to collapse in on itself, burying Michael for good, bringing to an end his decade-long killing streak. Back at home, Jamie grabs a pair of scissors and stabs her adoptive mother. No! 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 Has the evil transferred to her? Is Michael Myers really dead? Of course not. Michael Myers never dies. Less than a year later, Halloween 5 hit theater screens. After seeing it, a lot of fans felt that the film was rushed into production and didn't make much sense. They would be right. Part 5 would end up being the lowest grossing film in the entire franchise, even still up to when this video is released. What happened to this film that caused it to be the black sheep of the franchise? Let's find out what the f happened to this horror movie. Producer Mustafa Akkad had always been very vocal about how much he loved the Halloween franchise, and more importantly, how much money it made for him. One rule he had was that no matter what happened to Michael Myers, there had to be a way to bring him back for the sequel. As long as Michael's body was intact, he could always return for another movie. When Halloween 4 was a big hit at the box office, it was a sure thing that he would stalk his way back onto the big screen. Akkad turned to his Halloween 4 creative team, director Dwight Little and screenwriter Alan McElroy, but they decided not to come back for another installment. Mustafa tried multiple times to get Little to come back, but he had moved on from the series. In an interview for the book Taking Shape, he said, quote, My feeling was that the ending to our film was almost perfect in such a way that I didn't really know what to do after that. The producer would then turn to screenwriter Shem Bitterman. He turned in an unusual draft for Halloween 4, but Akkad had liked his writing, so he gave him another shot. Shem turned in a draft called Halloween 5, The Killer Inside Me. In his version, Jamie has taken on the evil from her uncle. She is now a teenager and begins to go on a killing spree. Little does she know that her uncle isn't dead and has returned to once again take out his entire family. Stuck in the middle is Jamie's adoptive sister, Rachel, who had to figure out how to stop both of them. Mustafa wasn't a big fan of the script, as he felt it was really more of a parody of the Halloween franchise than an actual entry into the series. He kept the script for the moment and began to look for a director. Deborah Hill actually recommended Swiss indie director Dominique Othon and Gerard. They had met at an event and had really hit it off. Akkad reached out and offered to meet with him. Othon and Gerard went and rented Halloween 4 to see what he would be working with. When Dominique showed up for his meeting, he also brought with him screenwriter Roger Harders. As he sat down with Akkad and Bitterman, he began to explain the problems he felt the script had. He asked Akkad, do you want to make a Halloween 6? To which Mustafa said yes. Dominique then grabbed the script, walked over, and threw it directly in the garbage can. He said that was the only way he would be able to make another Halloween film after part five. Akkad was livid and felt it was highly disrespectful to do such a thing. After a couple of seconds, he then asked him what he would do instead. Roger Harders then talked about turning the movie into something similar to the Frankenstein mythos. The film would open with Myers' lifeless body trapped among the debris that fell in on him at the end of the last movie. Cables and metal rebar would hold him as a big storm raged outside. Lightning would strike and the bolt would bring him back to life because of all the metal and cables that were holding him up. From there, it would show that he had been purged of his pure evil, but when confronted by people, they would keep trying to kill him. The goal was to make him sympathetic, and any violence he issued throughout the movie was just for his own survival. The only person that could see he had been cleared of the evil was Dr. Loomis, who tried to stop people from hurting him. It was a far cry from the Michael Myers audiences had seen before. Akkad hated the idea and shot it down. He did offer Dominique the chance to direct it and for Harders to write the film, but they had to come up with a different idea. Once he saw how much they were offering him to write, Harders turned it down. He didn't want to work for so little money if they weren't going to use the idea he really wanted to do. From there, Michael Jacobs was brought in. He and Dominique had worked together before and they clicked right away on the script. In Halloween 5, we learn that Michael was able to escape his mine shaft tomb just before they threw the bomb down to finish him off. He floats down river where he is found by a homeless man living in a shack. The man takes him where Michael lays motionless for an entire year. On Halloween, he wakes up 
puts his mask on and chokes the kind Samaritan that kept him alive for an entire year. Jamie, on the other hand, has been sent to an institution for children. She has been mute ever since the night she stabbed her adoptive mother with a pair of scissors. Her family has left town for the weekend to avoid the painful reminder of the year before. Rachel, though, feels bad leaving her there, so she stays home. Dr. Loomis keeps coming to see Jamie, only to aggressively suggest that she is still connected to Michael and wants to know where he is. Michael once again shows up to find his niece, but this time she seems to be psychically linked to him any time he is about to kill someone. Rachel ends up getting dispatched by Myers, so her friend Tina has to be the one to watch after Jamie and avoid getting killed on Halloween night. During this all is a mysterious man dressed all in black who shows up in town. We notice that he has a tattoo on his wrist that Michael has, but has never been shown up to this point. Michael eventually falls into a trap set by Loomis and the police. Loomis attacks Michael with a wooden plank, but falls on top of the killer, seeming to die of a heart attack. Michael is taken into custody and put in a jail cell. Moments later, the man in black arrives at the police station, kills everyone in the office, springs Myers, and takes Jamie. Roll credits. Before cameras even started rolling, there were problems. Donald Pleasance was not a fan of the direction the movie was going to go. He believed they should have been going forward with the notion that Jamie had taken on Michael's evil and Loomis had to stop her from following in the family tradition. This brought him into conflict with the director and Akkad himself. Mustafa wanted Jamie to be an innocent child, just like she had been in part four. Pleasance still agreed to be in the film, but wasn't happy with the idea. When he got on set, he found that he was constantly clashing with the director over how Loomis should be portrayed. Dominique wanted him to be overtly aggressive and almost a villain himself. Pleasance felt that Loomis would do what he could to stop Michael, but would never put a child in harm's way. He butted heads often over how the scenes were shot. After a while, he finally relented as his character was planned to be killed off in the final act. He figured, since he was leaving the franchise anyway, it wouldn't make much of a difference. Even when press were visiting the set, he would often talk about how he didn't like the story or direction the film was heading. He even let slip that Loomis was going to die in this film and that it was his last of the franchise. Another cast member who wasn't a fan of the script was Ellie Cornell. When she found out she was being brought back, she was excited. After she read the script, she was less than happy. 20 pages in, her character Rachel is killed off in a pretty gruesome scene. Michael stabbed her in the throat with a pair of scissors. Cornell thought it was too gruesome of an end for her character. She fought to have it changed, and instead, they had her get stabbed in the heart. Later, Mustafa Akkad expressed regret for okaying her character to be killed off. Dominique wanted to surprise the audience similar to the way Psycho had done back in 1960. They wanted fans to believe that Rachel would be the main character only to kill her off, showing that no one was safe in this movie. A much more interesting role was originally in the works for the Rachel character. The plan was to have her been traumatized by the events of the previous year. She had been hanging out with a different crowd and was much more of a freewheeling Rachel than we had seen before. We would have seen her still dealing with Michael's attack by spiraling into drugs and alcohol. She would have been a much more free spirit than the good girl we had seen in part four. As the script continued, it was decided to move her back to the same type of character we saw in the last film and add in a new character, Tina. She embodied everything Rachel was supposed to be originally. Fans did not take to Tina very well at all. About a third of the way through shooting the film, Mustafa Akkad came up with an idea he wanted to put into the movie to leave the audience on a cliffhanger. He pulled Dominique aside and said he wanted to add a mysterious character into the film. This would push the mystery into the next movie and make fans excited for the sequel. Dominique agreed, but had no idea what the character would mean. He opted to create the man in black and have him connected to Michael somehow. The rune tattoos were added to give them a direct link. When asked about the idea for the character, he states that he had no idea who the man was or how he was even connected to Myers. He said that would be for the next filmmaker to figure out. This handcuffed director Joe Chappelle for the next installment. He now had to figure out a story to explain the men in black and what their connection was. A lot of scenes were shot for the movie that ended up getting thrown on the cutting room floor. The original opening of the film had a completely different character meeting Michael after he narrowly escaped being blown up. 
the character was referred to as Dr. Death. Instead of a homeless man, he was a young man that was obsessed with the occult. He was in a shack with all sorts of skulls and symbols. We meet him as he's using tarot cards. Michael lands on his doorstep, and then we cut to a year later. The scene seems to indicate that Michael actually died from his wounds the year before. Dr. Death is once again performing a ritual on the body of Myers as his hand starts to twitch. Michael is revived and Dr. Death exclaims, he's alive! He celebrates that his ritual was successful. We see there are symbols all over the shack and are led to believe that the thorn tattoo on Michael's wrist was put there as part of the ceremony. That makes a lot more sense then it was just always there and no one ever noticed. Michael puts his mask back on and kills the evil doctor and goes on his merry way. This also is the event that lets Jamie know psychically that Michael has returned. It looks like they were going in a more supernatural direction than any of the Halloween films had done before. This could have been one of the reasons it was ultimately scrapped in favor of the opening we got. The ending was also tweaked. Originally, Sheriff Meeker is in his office when the man in black enters and begins his massacre. Meeker would run out into the office only to find Michael's empty cell. He would then die at the hands of the man in black. A gory photo of his death appeared in an issue of Fangoria magazine as they covered the film before release. It was later changed to Jamie discovering Michael's empty cell. Some minor changes throughout included that Jamie's friend Billy was supposed to be into BMX bikes. He was supposed to use his bike throughout the film then the car chase was supposed to have Billy and Jamie on his BMX trying to outrun Michael in his car. It was found that actor Jeffrey Landman was not very good at riding a bike. Seeing how much of a problem this was going to be, they purged any mention or use of the bike. Instead, the actors just ran from the car, which in reality does make it a more tense scene. One thing that a lot of fans dislike about this film is the presentation of the Myers house. In the original, it was a plain square house that didn't seem all that special. In this film, it's presented as a big Victorian house. Dominique felt that the original house wasn't very cinematic. He wanted something that had more room inside for the scenes where Michael and Loomis were facing off. Well, he didn't think the location change was a big deal, continuity snobs like myself did not enjoy this. But of course, we're talking about a franchise that has rebooted itself four times now, so I guess I can't complain too much. The film's biggest hurdle came when it went off to every film's dreaded stage of production. Say it with me, folks, the MPAA. During this time, they were being extremely harsh with horror films, and they didn't let this one slip by. They gave the film an X rating. In order to be able to do a wide release, they're gonna have to trim down a lot of the violence and gore from the film. Some of the scenes that were either trimmed or removed included a shot of Tina's boyfriend, Mikey, spasming on the ground after getting a hand rake stuck in his head. The shot was gruesome and made his death more explicit. When Michael punches through the windshield of a cop car, originally a piece of glass was shown embedded in the officer's face. That had to go. During the car chase in the field, Billy was originally supposed to get hit on his leg to injure him. That was scrapped, and instead, Billy just sort of falls away from the car. Maybe the most bloody scene nixed was when Samantha is killed with the scythe in the barn. It was originally supposed to go through her forehead. The jerks at the MPAA got their way, and the film got truncated down enough for an R rating. It hit theaters on October 13, 1989. Fans and critics alike didn't express much love for the film, but it did end up making a profit. This ensured that another entry in the franchise would be made, but fans were starting to wonder if they could trust the films anymore. When part six did come out, it showed that they couldn't. The whole franchise had to be rebooted to gain fans' interest again. After the highs of Halloween 4, it was only inevitable that the series would come crashing down again. No one thought it would be this soon. Halloween 5 is still the lowest grossing film in the entire franchise, and it seemed to waste any storylines that part four had set up. Many consider it the lowest point in the franchise. Sure, it's bad, but is it Busta Rhymes bad? Oof. That's another video for another time. Until then, trick, trick or treat. treat. Motherfucker.